guys. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, the topic which I'm going to discuss is the effects of psychotropic medications on the sleep-wake cycle. It's a, a pretty comprehensive topic, so I'm just going to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, in reference to the objectives, uh, first I'm going to link the neurophysiology of sleep to neurotransmitters. Uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, a lot of you will be able to appreciate the effects of psychotropic medications on these pathways and on sleep. And finally, I'm going to give some cases where knowing the pharmacology will help illuminate management of sleep disorders. Um, I can't um, emphasize this enough, uh, where knowing how the medications affect the sleep-wake cycle can improve uh, your care in treating sleep pathologies. I, I can't tell you the number of times where I'm in sleep clinic or in the mental health clinic and somebody will come in and they'll be complaining of insomnia and essentially uh, you know they've already done CBTI, their, their sleep apnea is under control, their AHI is less than two, they're using their CPAP and they're complaining of insomnia for the past six months. So I do a medicine reconciliation and I see that they're taking bupropion or Prozac at night which are activating meds, stimulatory meds, and you know they should be given in the morning. So all I do is I just switch the med to the morning time and the insomnia is gone after a few days. Kind of like complex problem, simple solution. Or can't tell you the number of times where I'll get a case where somebody's you know referred to me for narcolepsy, but they're taking mirtazapine during the day and that's attributing to their hypersomnolence symptoms, and I just switched the mirtazapine tonight. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll go through some cases of this. So the first thing I want to talk about is the neurophysiology. A lot of times we only discuss the neurophysiology as an academic exercise, but if we understand the neurophysiology of the sleep wake cycle, we'll have a, a better understanding of how these medications affect the sleep wake cycle. Um, and the way that I've divided it is, it is the, the, the wake system and the sleep system. And this is very important because both of these systems are interrelated. They have distinct features, but they work together. And I'll go over that in a few minutes. And after you break it down into the wake system and sleep system, you further break it down into neurotransmitters, pathways, and receptors. Uh, this is how I learned it, so this is how I'm putting it in the talk. And, it, and I promise it'll make sense very soon. So the first thing I want you to think about are the neurotransmitters, specifically the excitatory inhibitory neurotransmitters. So on the left side, you have all the excitatory neurotransmitters, uh, glutamate, orexin, acetylcholine, your, your monoamines, histamine, norepinephrine, dopamine. Um, so these are excitatory. So if you give a medication that enhances these neurotransmitters, it's going to cause a wake-promoting effect. You know, so it's important that medications which enhance these neurotransmitters are given during the day. Like if you think of something like uh, modafinil, it increases hypothalamic histamine, so it's given in the morning time. Uh, something like bupropion, which I mentioned, it increases norepinephrine and dopamine in the synapse, so you give it in the morning. Uh, Ritalin, which has the same mechanism as bupropion, is basically bupropion on steroids. So, you know, any medication that, it, that enhances these excitatory neurotransmitters will help you stay awake. In the same breath, any medication which blocks them will help you sleep. So, you know, and I'll go over that. The inhibitory neurotransmitters are GABA, glycine, and galanin. Uh, in reference to sleep, 99% is, is GABA. That's the one, that's the main one. 1% 1 is about galanin. galanin. So any medications which enhance the inhibitory neurotransmitters will help you sleep. So benzos uh, uh, increase GABA, a non-benzodiazepine receptor agonists like Ambi and Lanesta enhance GABA, they'll help you sleep. So you really want to commit these to memory. Um, interesting enough, the same excitatory neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, uh, dopamine, and serotonin, they're also the key neurotransmitters in depression, and that's why a lot of these wake-promoting agents help with depression. So the first thing I want to talk about 
is the sleep system and wake system. So Dr. Schaefer came up with this conceptual theory of this flip-flop switch or this seesaw mechanism, and that's why you see this wake switch here. So if you're awake and you're listening to me, this is what your brain looks like. In your brain stem, you have these wake-promoting neurotransmitters, uh, histamine in your tubular mammillary nucleus, norepinephrine in your locus rhodius, serotonin in your raphi nuclei, dopamine in your ventral tegmental area. These are all in your brain stem. So the projections of these neurons fire in a character characteristic pattern that promote wakefulness. They go through the basal forebrain and activate your cortex, and then you're awake. And your cortex is the largest area of your brain. Once you activate it, you're awake, and you can carry out important functions like speech and memory. But what's interesting is while this wake system is working, it's concomitantly inhibiting your sleep system. So that's how they work in harmony. And then. Later on tonight, maybe about 16 hours later, you go into your sleep system. And your sleep system, the main area is your ventral lateral preoptic nucleus, and that releases GABA, which inhibits all those wake promoting neurotransmitters that I just talked about, and you can go to sleep at night. So what allows you to go back and forth between this sleep system and this wake system? There has to be some modulator, some stabilizer. And hypocretin is the modulator, known in the sleep community as orexin. So orexin allows us to go back and forth between the sleep system and wake system. So orexin has a lot of functions. It directly activates all those wake-promoting neurotransmitters, your histamine, norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine. It also directly activates the cortex. So it's a very important neuropeptide. If you look at something like narcolepsy, um, particularly narcolepsy type 1, they're deficient in orexin, and so narcoleptics have a pathology of this switch, and that's why a big uh, symptom of narcolepsy is fragmented sleep and fragmented wakefulness. So here it is again, the flip-flop switch. Here's the wake switch, and you have all your wake-promoting neurotransmitters, um, your histamine, your norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine. Right now you're in your wake system, uh, you're awake, and concomitantly it's inhibiting your sleep system. And later on tonight, your sleep system takes over, which is mainly governed by GABA, and that inhibits all those wake-promoting neurotransmitters. So these are the key players involved. Uh, you have your pontine tegmentum, your, uh, your brain stem, your midbrain, pons, medulla, where all those wake-promoting transmitters are located. Uh, you have your posterior lateral hypothalamus where orexin is located. You have your BLPO around over here where the GABA is released. So now we know about the neurotransmitters, which ones are awake, which ones promote wake, which ones promote sleep. So let's look a little bit about the pathways. So your ascending arousal pathways are divided in your, into your cholinergic system and your monoamine system. So your cholinergic system is mainly acetylcholine, and your monoamine system is mainly serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. And then orexin is your alerting stabilizing system, which allows you to go back and forth between the two systems. So with your acetylcholine system, it starts around here in your pontine tegmentum. It projects to your thalamic relay and reticular nuclei, and then it goes to your cortex and keeps you awake. Its main function is to facilitate transmission of sensory information to your cortex. Uh, it fires rapidly in wake and REM, and it's inactive in REM. So this one's kind of interesting because essentially acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's involved in both wake and in sleep, particularly REM sleep. So maybe, you know, sometimes I look at the, the sleep studies and the epochs of wake and REM look similar. It's, and maybe it's because they're governed by the same neurotransmitter, but you know, in REM the chin tone is a little bit lower, so it's just something to think about. Your monoamine system is with your norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, your histamine. They project to the lateral hypothalamus, uh, the BLPO, the basal forebrain, and then activate the cerebral cortex, specifically so you can facilitate processing of thalamic information. They inhibit non-REM sleep generators, and they fire and wake slowly in non-REM, and they're silent in REM. The orexin system, it activates all those wake-promoting neurotransmitters. It directly activates the cortex, um, and it fires rapidly in wake, and it's silent in non-REM and, and, and in REM sleep. And then the sleep system, which we talked about, the flip-flop switch, 
the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus is what releases GABA, and that inhibits all those wake promoting neurotransmitters. What's interesting is that with your ventral lateral preoptic nucleus, it can inhibit orexin, but orexin cannot inhibit GABA. So GABA inhibits orexin, but orexin really has no significant effect on, on GABA. And then um, the GABA essentially inhibits both arousal systems and orexin. So I just want to talk briefly about GABA because it's a main CNS inhibitory neurotransmitter. Essentially, when you have a medication that enhances GABA, what happens is that you, like let's take for instance, like a benzodiazepine binds to the GABA receptor. So you cause an increase influx of chloride ions. Chloride ions have a negative charge, so you have an influx of this, these negative charge ions. They hyperpolarize the cell, they delay the action potential and suppress nerve activity, and that's how it helps us go to sleep. Uh, benzos increase the frequency of the chloride ion channels opening and barbiturates increase the duration. So putting it all together, here's you know a cross section. So you have the two arousal systems. You have the acetylcholine system and the pontine tegmentum. It goes to the thalamus and then from there it goes to the basal forebrain and activates the cerebral cortex. Your other ascending arousal system is your monoamine system, which goes to your lateral hypothalamus, basal forebrain, activates the cerebral cortex, and then orexin activates both systems in the cerebral cortex directly, and then essentially your VLPO will inhibit everything when it's time to go to bed. So depending on your background, this slide might be of some utility to you. Um, essentially, uh, it characterizes which neurotransmitters are active in which sleep state and wake state. So we talked about the neurotransmitters, we talked a little bit about the pathways, and now we have to talk about the receptors. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. This is where you have to know the granular details. Uh, because you have a neuron which releases a neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter binds to a receptor on another neuron. And contingent on which receptor it binds to, that's going to be the desired effect of sleep or wake. So we can, this is a pretty comprehensive list, so we'll just go through a couple of them. So if you agonize alpha-2, something like clonidine, you're going to promote sleep. Uh, we talked about uh, orexin. If you block orexin, it's the main weight-promoting neurotransmitter, something like Valsamra, it's going to promote sleep. Medications that inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine um, and serotonin and dopamine, those are wake-promoting neurotransmitters they are going to promote wakefulness. So something like that inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine, something like Adderall or, you know, uh, Concerta or something like that. So, you know, but where it gets tricky is, like, if we look at something like histamine, if you block H1, like clozapine or with Benadryl, you promote sleep. So let me see if I can go back for a minute. So you have histamine in your tubular mammillary nucleus. So if you give something like Benadryl, normally your histamine is firing, it sends uh, a signal through this ascending arousal pathway and activates the cortex. What Benadryl will do is it will actually block that signal. And that's how it works. So if you block H1, it promotes sleep. But in the same breath, you know, you have to know these receptors in detail because if you block, block H3, that promotes wakefulness. Something like patilosant, you know, uh, we use that for narcolepsy, that blocks H3 and that causes a secondary release of glutamate, norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, and that promotes wakefulness. And this is just an example of different histamine receptors like H1, you know, Benadryl, you block H1, you get sedation and drowsiness, H2, you block H2, you block gastric acid secretion, you block H3, you have a secondary release of neurotransmitters, excitatory ones specifically, and it promotes wakefulness. There's about 22 serotonin receptors that we know about, and depending on which ones you activate or block, that will have that desired effect that you want on sleep or like being awake. So the first group of meds I'm going to talk about are SSRIs. The reason why I put this first is because they're the most commonly prescribed meds in the world. Yes, every six seconds an SSRI is prescribed. They're not just used for depression, they're used for PTSD, OCD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, a lot of different things. Cough. Say it. Cough. 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 <laughs> 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 
So, you know, so the, the, the issue is that we all know that SSRIs increase the reuptake of serotonin, that's no secret, but they each have a secondary pharmacological mechanism of action which makes them unique. And no two SSRIs have the same secondary pharmacological mechanism of action, and maybe that's why some people respond differently from one to the other. Um, so just briefly, uh, there's, different neuro, there's different pathways for depression, a dopaminergic, a neuroadrenergic, and a serotonergic. This is the serotonergic hypothesis. Normally what happens is you have, if somebody's depressed, here's a presynaptic area, and it releases the serotonin, and it binds to 5-HT1A, and you have an antidepressant effect, and you have a euthymic mood. Everything in life is based on receptors. You're running on the treadmill. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, that's your norepinephrine binding to a receptor. You're playing at Las Vegas, you're winning in craps, you're happy, that's your dopamine binding to a receptor. So what happens with depression is that we think, what, what we think happens is that the serotonin is reabsorbed back up here and it doesn't get to bind to 5-HT1A. So when you give an SSRI, something like uh, Zoloft or Prozac, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it blocks the absorption. So then the serotonin can come down and bind to 5-HT1A, and we have this antidepressant effect. But at the cost of doing business, you're also binding to 5-HT2A and 5-HT2C, and then you get the sexual dysfunction, insomnia, and anxiety. So a lot of times when I'm in clinic, particularly the mental health clinic, I'll have somebody on Prozac or Zoloft, and they're not depressed anymore, they're not suicidal, but... They have insomnia, or they'll have, uh, you know, if it's a guy, they'll have erectile dysfunction. If it's a female, they might have lack of orgasms. And I say, okay, well, let me take you off this med since these, these, these side effects are coming. And they say, no, 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 I'm not depressed anymore. I got to stay on it. What I'll do in that case is I'll give a low dose trazodone because a low dose trazodone specifically blocks these postsynaptic receptors. So that way you don't have these side effects. It's kind of like you're giving a med to treat the side effect of another med, but unfortunately that's the case. And that's why I like mirtazapine, because, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, because mirtazapine, in addition to releasing serotonin, it concomitantly blocks these receptors, so it helps you sleep, there's no sexual dysfunction, and there's no anxiety. So, so is that the presumed mechanism of why trazodone is sometimes uses, I mean, oftentimes uses sleeping? That That's precisely the two, yes. Two C. It blocks 5-HT2C and 5-HT2A, and also it's an antihistamine. Okay. And, and that's that, that's how it works at low doses from 25 to you know 150. I have a slide showing. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering, like, I mean, maybe they're gonna address it, but like, I feel like you know whatever you do with the, the package label inserts, mm -hmm. um, you all say insomnia is a side effect, but some will say hypersomnia also. Mm -hmm. So is there, are there certain ones that are more likely to cause one profile versus another? Yeah, depending on the secondary pharmacological mechanism of action, yeah, there, there are definitely, and uh, uh, trazodone is a very sedating antidepressant, and unfortunately that precludes its use, but at, at low doses, you can figure out how much of the histamine receptors it's blocking and how much of 5-HT2A, and you can kind of predict the, the, the profile. I'll, I'll definitely go through that. Uh, so the first one is Zoloft that I'm going through. Um, I know these are busy slides. I'll hone in on the key points. So the Zoloft secondary pharmacological mechanism of action is that it increases dopamine. And we know that dopamine is a weight-promoting neurotransmitter. Subsequently, Zoloft should be given in the morning. Um, since if you give it with a stimulant, it reinforces those, uh, that, that inhibitory uptake of dopamine. But since it's a stimulating med, if somebody's depressed and they have anhedonia, psychomotor retardation, they feel like a bump on a log, or they have hypersomnia, I'll give Zoloft for ancillary support. You know, so, you know, generally doses greater than 50 will increase the reuptake of dopamine. I can't tell you the number of times I'm in clinic and, you know, somebody has insomnia for a few weeks, they've established a temporal relationship of commencement of Zoloft like five, six weeks ago, and they're taking it at night. And then I just switch it to the morning, and the insomnia has resolved. Mm -hmm. And this is this is something that happens, you know, because you got patients that say, you know, hey, doc, I'm taking all my meds at night, my statin at night, I just want to take this at night. And then if you're not aware that this is an activating antidepressant, it can lead to insomnia if given at night. 
Its other secondary pharmacological mechanism of action is that it works on the sigma receptor, which is called the sigma enigma, because it modulates anxiety and psychosis. So PTSD is really an anxiety condition because, you know, acute stress disorder is day one through day 30. If it goes beyond 30 days, it becomes PTSD. And that's why, since this works on the sigma receptor, this is FDA approved for PTSD. The sigma receptor is also associated with psychosis, so we generally use Zoloft for major depressive disorder, recurrent severe with psychotic features. Um, Prozac, fluoxetine, this is probably the most activating SSRI, uh, mainly because its secondary pharmacological mechanism of action is that it increases norepinephrine. And when you block 5-HT2C, you actually cause another release of norepinephrine and dopamine. So now you've got a med that's working on serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, all these wake-promoting neurotransmitters. So this med definitely has to be given in the morning. You know, uh, you definitely want to make sure this med is given early in the morning due to its activating effects to prevent insomnia. Paxil, on the other hand, is the most sedating antidepressant and mainly because it's anticholinergic. I know a lot of you see this inhibitory effect of uh, increasing norepinephrine in the synapse, but it's really minute compared to its anticholinergic effects. And Paxil also has some antihistaminergic properties. So Paxil should be given at night. And it's very important because what ends up happening is that if somebody's taking Paxil like 40, 50 milligrams, 60 milligrams during the day, they end up taking naps during the day and then they fall asleep during the day. That messes up their homeostatic sleep drive and then they can't sleep at night. So when you got Paxil above 40 milligrams, you really, really want to make sure that the person's taking it at nighttime. Luvox, uh, despite being the first SSRI that came out, never got FDA approved for depression. It's, um, it's used for OCD. Um, what's interesting about Luvox is that you generally want to give this one at night too because it inhibits the degradation of melatonin. So when I'm titrating up this medication for OCD, 50, 100, 150, 200, when they're at 200, I make sure they're taking it at night. Um, I, a nice way to remember this is, um, you know, you can look at Zoloft has Z in it, and then Prozac has Z in it, so take it, take it in the morning to get your Zs at night. I, I know it's quite comical, but it's an easy way to remember it. Um, Paxil, again, very sedating due to its anticholinergic effects, and Luvox, very sedating because it inhibits the degradation of melatonin. This one is a little bit unclear, the citalopram and escitalopram. I've been looking at this over the years, and from the best I can tell you is that these are considered neutral for the majority of the population. What happened is citalopram came out first, but it has this, it has this R antimer, which is associated with QT prolongation. So it has a sealing effect, and for that reason, they came out with escitalopram. I'll tell you this, that generally citalopram you can really give it from a clinical posture in the morning or evening. It's not going to, it's not a uh, citalopram. You can give it in the morning or evening. It's not going to make a bit of a difference. The same thing, it's the same thing with escitalopram, but in about 20% of the population, escitalopram causes some sedation due to its antihistaminergic effect. And so there, it, you, you might have to gauge it with the patient and say, hey, um, you know, kind of feel it out if you're tired during the, the day taking it and you want to continue to take it, then, you know, please take it. Is that a short-term effect, like, you know, when they're first titration three or four or six weeks and then afterwards it could get better? Or? That's a good question. I've seen both. Um, I, sometimes I don't think it's due to pharmacology. I think it's due to the genetics, you know, yeah. But, but I, what I've seen is about 20% of the population. Uh, the reason why I say genetics is because sometimes people who have a mutation in the hypocretin type 2 receptor gene, they generally find this medication more sedating, mm -hmm. you know, for non-clear reasons. And are these two becoming <coughs> more popularly prescribed? Say it again? Are these two being more popularly prescribed compared to the other classic ones? So, you know... I feel like I see more. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's that's a fair question. I'll tell you that escitalopram is FDA approved for both generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder and maybe killing two birds with one stone. You know, sometimes depression and anxiety are two sides of the same coin. If you treat one, the other gets better. So a lot of people like escitalopram. Escitalopram doesn't work on serotonin as much. 
So we have serotonin receptors in the gut, and you know that's why these SSRIs are associated with diarrhea and constipation. So if someone has Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and I have to give them an SSRI, I'll, I'll generally choose this one. Um, you know, in, in terms of citalopram, a lot of people like it because it has less drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and maybe that's why it's prescribed more often. Um, Paxil is used, uh, the paroxetine, which I mentioned quite frequently because it has the most indications of all SSRIs and it inhibits the serotonin pump the most. I generally don't like it because it has a very short half-life. Uh, at John Hopkins, they prescribe sertraline a lot, Zoloft, because it has a lot of indications and its side effect profile is less likely. Um, but to answer your question, I see escitalopram prescribed a lot, you know, too. Um, so trazodone. Um, I put this in here because we see it so much, and this is what trazodone looks like at 300 milligrams, but this is a multifunctional med. At doses of 25 to 150, it blocks 5-HT2A, alpha-1, and H1, and that's why it has those sedative properties. Um, what's interesting about this medication is this is a relative selectivity bar graph. The top part is the 50% mark and the middle is the 100% mark. So if you just look at 50 milligrams of trazodone, you're already blocking 50% of those histamine receptors. So it's pretty sedating. But what's also interesting is that it's really not, I know it says 150 to 600 here, but if you look at the literature, it really doesn't touch the serotonin pump until about 150, and it doesn't inhibit the serotonin pump until around 300. So it's not an antidepressant until really 300 milligrams. But at 50 milligrams, you're saturating about 60 to 70 percent of the alpha receptor. So this is important because if you decide to use trazodone in someone who has a mental health condition, you know, some, um, you worry, it's an alpha blocker, so you worry about orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, lightheadedness, those kind of things. So if I give, you know, Eric 50 milligrams of trazodone and he tells me, oh, it's partially working, can I go up on it? And I say, sure. But he says, I read about this orthostatic hypotension, I'll tell them you're not going to get it because you've already blocked the majority of those alpha receptors. So it's, it's very good in that sense that this orthostatic hypotension is not dose dependent with trazodone. If they don't get it at a low dose, they're not going to get it at a high dose, unlike prazosin, which is dose dependent. Um, so I, I wanted to make this a little bit interactive. Can uh, somebody <coughs> read this one? Sure. A 50-year-old obese female comes into the sleep clinic for follow-up upon review of her pat down load of four hour, greater than 4-hour usage of 90%. Her residual AHI was 1.4 and her leak is insignificant. She reports difficulty with sleep initiation and sleep maintenance, which started a few weeks ago after a psychiatrist placed her on antidepressant at night. She reports her mood symptoms have resolved but is concerned about her insomnia, which antidepressant was she likely prescribed. A, Zoloft, B, Paxil, C, Remeron, D, Lumox. Any, any takers? Anyone? Rick? Um, <laughs> Since you're just so mellow in here. <laughs> well, we have a resident here, too, so we can pick up John, too. I mean, it's <laughs> probably A or B, but I'll go for A. Good. Yes. Good, yeah, you're right, it, it is letter A. Since you, you did so well on this one, you can do the next one. <laughs> After informing her of the... Uh, so we could probably have to project a little bit so that it's can hear it. After informing her of the antidepressant, which is likely the cause of her insomnia, she reports, I only take the medication at night. What antidepressant can I take at night, which will likely help me sleep at night? Um, from all that... Not Prozac, not definitely not Prozac. Uh, what help her sleep? Hold on, I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> so Cilopran so is is like a neutral. Uh, Paxil is sedating antidepressants. So I would go with Paxil. Good, good. so Paxil, <laughs> right. I know if you want to take a look at the chat now or later. Say it again. If you want to take a look at the chat. Uh, we can take a look now since we're doing the interactive part. Oh, oh, 
also people <laughs> answering. All right, all right. So all everybody's right. Uh, everybody's paying attention. That's that's great. Good. We have a couple of fellows and people on there too. If we want to ask somebody. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So the PSG reports vary. I, the de decreased total sleep time, I think this is contingent on what time the, uh, the medication is given, but in general, they, they, some of them decreased total sleep time. A lot of these studies shows, showed that the patients were taking Prozac and Zoloft at night, unfortunately. Uh, increased wake time. The, anything, that block, anything that increases serotonin will uh, decrease REM sleep. Um, so even the SNRIs, anything that increases serotonin will decrease REM sleep and anything that increases serotonin will increase your risk of periodic limb movement disorder and RLS. And that's why, you know, bupropion doesn't cause PLMD because it only works on norepinephrine and dopamine. Um, with the SSRIs, um, fluoxetine has been associated with slow eye movements uh, during non-REM sleep, but that's not unique to fluoxetine. It's seen with all all SSRIs, and SSRIs can cause REM sleep without atonia and REM sleep behavioral disorder. What essentially happens is that when that serotonin binds to 5-HT1A, that increases your muscle tone. And, and again, that's why bupropion doesn't have that concern. So a lot of times, and this is important because, you know, in sleep clinic or in the mental health clinic, I see a, a young female acting out her dream. She's 30 years old. It's in the second half of the night, her eyes are closed, and I said, she's not 55, she's not, you know, I'm not really, you know, because RBD is generally in a middle-aged population, and then I see that she started Prozac a few weeks ago and just started, so what I do is just switch them, well, I tell their psychiatrist to switch them to bupropion, you know, so if you, sometimes they, they can connect the dots and establish a temporal relationship with acting out the dreams and starting an SSRI. Um, can I have a taker for this one? John, go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> a 27-year-old woman comes in with a history of BPD. She reports a history of cutting her wrist four times in the past year in an effort to end her life. She engages in psychodynamic psychotherapy but endorses suicidal ideation currently. She decides to start fluoxetine and she agrees. She asks you the most appropriate time to take the medication, which is 7 p.m. 12 p.m. or 8 a.m. I said, depends on when she has to get up and go to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's a third shift worker. <laughs> then my answer will change. <laughs> she has a typical schedule from the AA. Good, perfect. So it's, a, it's the most activating SSRI. So um, is, is Sam here? Because he, he read an MSLT with me. I wanted him to do this one. I'm here. Right there. Oh, there you go. VIP service. <laughs> go ahead, Sam. Uh, okay. Uh, Brenda is a 28 year old woman who is treated by a psychiatrist for symptoms of depression and anxiety. She feels tired during the daytime and often worries about how well she performs at work. She thinks that her concentration is poor. Some days she will nap if she has the opportunity. At night, she has difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. She says her mind is always too busy. She believes that her um, eloprazolam um, and paroxetine uh, help her with anxiety, but she wishes they were more effective. Since she is overweight, BMI 29, and has disrupted sleep, her primary care physician ordered a laboratory uh, sleep study to see whether obstructive sleep apnea might be present. Her doctor also decided to order a multiple sleep latency test since he had recently attended an educational program on narcolepsy. Um, looks like the uh, Polystomogram showed a sleep latency of uh, 18 minutes, not too bad. REM latency 165, uh, total sleep time 380, sleep efficiency 79%, and NREM, HI7, um, REM9, periodic wind movement, uh, 15 per hour, uh, multiple sleep latency test, um, mean sleep latency seven minutes, uh, REM sleep, I guess, captured um, in NAP 12. I'm at 12 minutes in that two. 
Brenda's nighttime sleep study and MSLT result. I see A confirms the suspicion that she has narcolepsy. Um, supports B supports the hypothesis um, that she has narcolepsy. Uh, so a five uh, MSLT should be performed to confirm diagnosis. Confirm the C concern. Confirm the, the that she does not have narcolepsy. D are not valid for the evaluation of narcolepsy. So these are the, the results again. What, what do you think? So her sleep latency wasn't too bad in the, uh, the sleep study. Um, her, her, she does have a uh, mild OSA. Um, her sleep efficiency was okay. Um, MSLT wise, uh, she did fall asleep in seven minutes, which is technically below eight minutes, which is oftentimes what we look for. And there was one episode where they captured um, REM sleep. Um, but uh, it never s stated whether or not she, um, so she's taking Paxil. Um, then you know that uh, she should have been weaned off of um, Paxil before the uh, study because um, at least a certain amount of time in order to uh, keep it from interfering with the study. So even though REM was captured, um, it made, I don't think it's necessarily considered to be a valid study. Um, Good, so the, the, answer is, the, the answer is B. So, you're right, the paroxetine inhibits REM sleep, it's sedating, it might even influence the, the mean sleep latency. Um, can you do the, the next one too, if you don't mind? Exploring Brenda's study, the following day realized um, that both the paroxetine and Alaprazolam could affect her degree of sleepiness and REM propensity. It was decided that a nighttime sleep study and MSLT should be repeated the following day with her off her medication. Um, multiple sleep latency minutes number two. Um, so you have the, the two results next to each other. So you have uh, 11 minutes for her sleep latency for the second test and you find REM in naps one, two, and three. Um, and then we have, of course, the results of the first test, which only had uh, REM in nap 12 at 12 minutes, nap two at 12 minutes, and a mean sleep latency of uh, seven minutes. Uh, so her second, the result of her second test, essentially C. A confirms suspicion, B supports of the hypothesis that she's narcolepsy, C confirms that she does not have narcolepsy, and um, D are not valid for the evaluation of narcolepsy. Uh, since um, we know that uh, uh, SSRIs can suppress um, REM. Uh, we are more likely to, and also um, Paxil is um, uh, more, what's the word for it, uh, sedating. If she's not taking that or she's been off of it for just a single day, she's probably going to go through withdrawals, which so you might see higher levels of uh, REM as sort of a rebound kind of thing. And also um, she might be more awake because the Paxil is not on board as much anymore. So, so D? Good, yeah. So a, a lot of times, um, you know, when you do these PSG MSLT studies, you, you really want to make sure that the patient's off sedating medications if possible for at least two weeks. Um, since the tech, advise that she stop the paroxetine abruptly, there could be some, some REM rebound. What I, there's, there's a paucity of literature on this, but generally what you would really want is for the person to be off the antidepressant for at least five to six weeks if possible. And that's why you really have to coordinate with the mental health provider to say, hey, she has this MSLT coming up in about two months. We need her off this because we want a clean study and we don't want any confounding factors. Um, Probably just, just one coronary for the fellows. Like, so this is why we don't allow non-sleep providers to order MSLTs because of the coordination and making sure the test is being done for the proper reasons. Makes sense. Yeah, definitely. 
Uh, hey, Sam, do you mind doing the last one? Sure. Uh, the periodic limb movements noted on the PSG um, likely are associated with um, let's see, restless legs, neuropathy, alprazolam, and paroxetine. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about how um, especially young females will have sort of, um, uh, so I say paroxetine. Okay, yeah. So generally any medication that increases serotonin has a propensity to cause uh, PLMD. Okay, so I'm gonna like be very brief. This is one of my favorite medications, so I don't wanna go too <laughs> long on this, but it's it, it came out in 1996 by a company called Oregon. The name of this medication is mirtazapine. This is very important because this medication is the only medication that the lower the dose, the more sedating. So please remember that. The lower the dose, the more sedating. It comes in 7.5, 15, 30, 45, and 60. 60s FDA approved in Europe, not in the US. But essentially, this medication is a presynaptic alpha-2 antagonist. It's a presynaptic alpha-2 blockers. So you have serotonergic and neuroadrenergic neurons. They have alpha-2 receptors on them. And they're kind of holding the serotonin and norepinephrine above the synapse. When you block these presynaptic alpha-2 receptors, you cut those brain cables, and then the serotonin and dopamine, I mean the serotonin and norepinephrine come down and bind to those respect, recept, uh, respective receptors. So at every, every dose, this med is an antihistamine. At 7.5, it's an antihistamine. At 15, at 30 is when it starts to release norepinephrine and serotonin. 30, 40, and then at 45, it releases more norepinephrine, and at 60, it releases a, a lot of norepinephrine. So the higher you go above 30, you're releasing this norepinephrine, and you're counteracting that antihistaminergic effect. So if you give somebody 7.5, I don't mean to be too animated, but they'll sleep all throughout the night. They'll come, they'll come in the next day and say, Doc, you helped me sleep throughout the whole night, but I feel like a zombie the next day. I can't function. I'm too tired. You give them 15 milligrams, still predominantly antihistaminergic. They'll sleep through the night, and they'll still feel tired the majority of the population. When you give them 30, you start releasing that norepinephrine, and that's a good balance. About 95% of my patients are on 30 milligrams because they can still sleep through the night, and they don't have that next day residual sleepiness. So, I, I, so the majority of the patients I have are on 30. I usually prescribe this if someone has depression with comorbid insomnia. When you give 45, you still give it at night. Um, even though it's releasing some norepinephrine, there's only a subset of the population which find 45 activating. You might have to switch it to the morning, but the majority of the time you'll keep it at night. But when you give 60 milligrams, you have to give it during the day because it's releasing so much norepinephrine that it's, it's gonna keep the person awake. I even, we tried to do a study in the VA using 60 milligrams of mirtazapine during the day for narcolepsy, but we had to stop because the LFTs were increasing. So keep in mind, the lower the dose, the more sedating. But when you go to that 60 dose and you switch to the mid, do you see that their sleep is then affected at night because the lower dose was helping, the more the higher dose is activating? That's a good question. I, I don't have an answer for that. I haven't seen. I mean, I've seen patients on 60 during the day in some of the satellite clinics at the VA. Um, I haven't, you know, just I haven't like talked to those patients, but that's a, something to definitely probe into. I imagine it could. I, I imagine it could. That's definitely something to look into. Um, I, I haven't had any patients on 60. I've seen one or two when I'm in sleep clinic that their other provider did that. So that's something definitely I'll ask the next time I see them, and that, that could be, you know, a cause of concern. So definitely. Could, sorry, quick caution. You said that it, at 30 milligrams, it started that release of norepinephrine. Yeah, right. You're blocking some of those presynaptic elements. <laughs> right. But what about between 7.5 and 15? Why is 7.5? Because at 7.5, it's just an antihistamine. Right. At 15, it's predominantly just an antihistamine. When you get to 30, that's when that norepinephrine starts coming to counteract that antihistamine. Right. Effect. So meaning at 15, there's, there will be a little bit of counter effect as well. So that's why so 15, 15 is not no. as oh, so, so, yeah. so to answer your question, at 15, there's a little bit of serotonin released. Oh, okay. But there's only three studies showing. Just serotonin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay.
And what's interesting is that if you block 5-HT2A and 5-HT2C, if we go back to that other slide, those modulate anxiety, insomnia, sexual dysfunction, and that's why mirtazapine doesn't have those side effects. Uh, let me just, uh, if I can go back just to show a little bit. Right here. So mirtazapine concomitantly blocks these receptors also. Okay. So th this is a, a very important medication. I can't tell you the number of times I'm in sleep clinic and I get a referral for narcolepsy and they say, can you please put this person on a stimulant and they end up taking, you know, mirtazapine 7.5 in the morning. And then so that's attributing to their hypersomnolent symptoms. If you wanted to use mirtazapine PRN for sleep, you could get away with 7.5 and 15. But if, you know, if you're going to use it with continuity, you know, if you have, if you're going to take it at 30 milligrams, it has to be, be taken nightly because then you're working on serotonin and your epinephrine, you're treating the depression. But if you wanted to use a PRN, you could use like 7.5 if in the unlikely event somebody could tolerate it. So the, reason it's, Sorry, yeah, the, the reason it's not used as a, like trazodone as a sleeping medication is that it has certain side effects as well. Yeah, the biggest side effect, and they, they were using it in John Hopkins in 1996 for women who had breast cancer and ovarian cancer. They were going through chemotherapy to help them eat and sleep. Mirtazapine does cause weight gain, uh, so, you know, so you have to keep that in mind. At higher doses, less likely because of the release in norepinephrine, but at lower doses, the weight gain is definitely a cause of concern for some people. Um, in depressed patients, it increases total sleep time, it improves sleep efficiency, doesn't affect REM that much. Um, but there's been some studies that at 15 milligrams after nine days, it doesn't affect um, your driving ability, your next day we're retracting performance. Uh, can somebody do these, one of these questions? How about Suzanne? Are you on there? Uh, I'm here. It's Ramat. I'll try. Oh, Ramat. Good. Bye. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, a patient complains of insomnia, sleeping two hours a night, and depression. You decide to prescribe mirtazapine at bedtime. Which dose is likely to help him fall asleep? So we talked about um, the lower doses. So I guess we just start at the 7.5 and see how they feel the next day or... Do you shoot for the middle and go for 15 so you can help them out? <laughs> this, is a, this is a tough question. So they're just asking which one is like most likely or likely to help them fall asleep. So just this is just for purposes of understanding the meds. So okay. 7.5, you're right. Um, do you mind uh, doing the, the next one? Sure. Um, the same patient comes back three days later and says, Doc, I'm sleeping seven hours a night but feel tired all day. You made me feel like a zombie. I have a wedding to go to in five days. <laughs> what is the next step? Um, so it's good that you talked about, it doesn't have a lasting effect. So it's not something we need to wean off. You can even use it as needed. Um, so we can increase the dose because this will have um, less sedating features on him. So we can go to uh, 15 at night. Sure, sure, it makes sense. You can try 15. How about this one? A veteran comes into the clinic, into the sleep clinic and reports he may have narcolepsy and will like a stimulant. Upon medicine reconciliation, you notice he is taking mirtazapine 30 milligrams in the morning. He reports that the current dose of 30 is adequately treating his depression. What is the next step in management? Um, I guess we just switch it to nighttime, especially if he's already getting like antidepressant um, benefits from it, right? Why, why change the dose? And I don't know, it might help him be fine sleeping at night, make it even better, even though he doesn't have complaints of sleeping at nighttime. Sure. Yeah, that's the right answer. So you just switch it to, to nighttime. Good. So I'm glad, uh, everyone has a, an understanding of this med. You will definitely, sorry, go ahead. So, so, so do you counsel, you know, in terms of when you're prescribing, do you counsel that we may actually have to go up on the doses? A lot of people just suck. Yeah, so uh, I guess I, I, I have uh, the, the, the ability, well, I, I'm lucky in the VA, I get an hour for a lot of my patients, so <laughs> I actually, you know, tell them we're going to take 7.5 for two days, you're going to hate me afterwards.
nerves because you're going to feel like a zombie. We're going to put you on 15 for two days. You'll feel much better. And then we're going to move to 30. So, yeah. Oh, so you move that fast. Yeah. Um, so the TCAs, uh, you know, they're not... So these medications, these were the first antidepressants that came out. Um, they're not prescribed as much because of their side effect profile, but I, I do want to go through a few of these because you do see them sometimes. They're basically five medications in one. They increase, the, uh, they increase serotonin and norepinephrine. They're anticholinergic. They block alpha-1 and they're antihistamines. For this group, you don't have to know the receptor binding profile, just know the class and you can figure out their effects on the sleep-wake cycle. So the secondary ones, the dicipramine, nortriptyline, protriptyline, you can remember DNP if you want. These are the most activating TCAs, so of course they should be given in the morning. And the reason why these are so activating is because out of all those five receptors and neurotransmitters, these affect norepinephrine the most. So if you look at dicipramine over here, it really increases, it inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine. You get a lot of norepinephrine. In fact, this med is so energizing. My chairman one time used it for depression and someone who was depressed and suicidal, he gave him dicipramine. And then two days later, we found the guy in the ER and we said, hey, hey, what happened? He said, you know, I, I got so energetic from the dicipramine, I actually had the the ability to carry out my plan and get the rope. So the energizing effect kicked in before the antidepressant effect. So, you know, these are very activating. The tertiary ones, um, essentially, the amitriptyline, clopripramine, amipramine, doxepin, uh, these are more sedating because they don't work on norepinephrine as much. They're more antihistaminergic and more anticholinergic. So you can kind of remember DNP for these um, to figure out which ones are activating. So with the sedating ones, like the amitriptyline, clomipramine, they're, they're gonna suppress REM sleep because they do work on serotonin. Uh, they shorten your sleep latency, they improve your sleep efficiency, reduce your wake, ap wake after sleep onset, and they appear to have efficacy in short and long-term insomnia. I'm not advocating to use these for sleep, but you know, in, in some cases, like if somebody, so amitriptyline is an antidepressant. So if somebody has uh, depression, migraine headaches, and insomnia, I might go for amitriptyline in that case. You know, so you know, it's kind of killing a few birds with one stone. And then the secondary ones, of course, are going to have the opposite effect. They're going to reduce your sleep insufficiency, cause more nocturnal sleep fragmentation, and worsen insomnia because they work more on norepinephrine. This is a Ki constant chart, and the lower the number, the higher the affinity uh, for that receptor. So I'm just going to go through one or two of them. Um, so let's look at dicipramine, because that's really activating. So anything lower than 20 is considered a high number. So the higher the number, the greater the affinity. So if you look at dicipramine, 0 0.83, it, it really increases your norepinephrine. Okay, and then, but it's really not that much of an antihistamine, so it's very activating. If you go something, go down like, uh, let's use amitriptyline, so that's common. Low number for histamine, so it's strongly antihistaminergic. This is less than 20, it's strongly anticholinergic, so it's very sedating, and it really doesn't work on norepinephrine that much. Okay. So can uh, somebody volunteer for this one? Which two TCAs are likely to lead to insomnia if given at night? I uh, see doxepin, protriptyline, and triptyline, and grid, and protriptyline. Um, it's a DMP, I would say C. Good, good, good. So low dose doxepin, I really just want to talk about this briefly. I, I know a lot of people are familiar with this. It's really just FDA approved for sleep maintenance insomnia. At low doses, at three and six milligrams, it's just an antihistamine. So really, really what it is essentially for the dose that it's used for insomnia is just this. That's it. That's all it is. It's just an antihistamine. Um, its affinity towards the histamine receptor is 100 times greater than any other receptor. So it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it really hones in on histamine. Um, it's important to know the receptor binding profile because, you know, I, I've used this medication on um, patients when I'm covering the consult service. There was a Parkinson's patient and, 
he had difficulty with sleep. In the VA, we don't have three and six milligrams. We have 10 milligram capsules. So I gave him 10 milligrams and he is sleep maintenance insomnia resolved. The neurologist comes back to me and says, hey, 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 you know, what about the narrow angle glaucoma, the urinary retention, all this stuff? I said, well, look, it's not anticholinergic until 25 milligrams. So he's not gonna get that side effect. So you don't get that narrow angle glaucoma unless the person's on 25 milligrams. That's mm -hmm. when it's anticholinergic. So it's helpful to know that, you know, because it can really make a difference in, in, in how you can, when you can prescribe the med. The other thing I just want to mention is, you know, you have to take it on an empty stomach, otherwise it's going to delay the absorption. A lot so, of, go ahead. So that, that 10 milligram dose you think is the same almost as doing it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not good. They've done they've done some studies with that where they've shown that the so as you increase the dose, it's going to be more sedating, but at the cost of doing business, then you start to affect other neurotransmitters because it's a tertiary. It's obviously a lot easier to get a ten milligram doxycycline. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have that one in the VA. Uh, so you know, and, 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 and I didn't put it here, but you know, it's the same thing with like quetiapine. 25 to 200, it's just an antihistamine. From 200 to 400, it increases serotonin. It's not an antipsychotic until 400 milligrams or it blocks dopamine. So a lot of times I'll have someone on risperidol, I'll add low dose quetiapine and they'll say, hey, is he gonna get neuroleptic malignant syndrome? It's two antipsychotics, but even though the bottle is still discontinued. Yeah, so it's the same principle here. Um, I'm gonna go through these briefly for the interest of time. Um, Venlafaxine, it's very commonly used. It's the first SNRI to come out. The only thing I want to tell you about this is that at, at 150 milligrams, it works on norepinephrine, so it's activating. So we titrate this med up 37.5, 115, 150, 225, etc. But you know, sometimes patients say, "Can I take it at night?" I take my other meds at night. I say, "Sure, but not." But once you get to 150, you got to take it in the morning time. You know, so at 150, it, it works on norepinephrine. So if you have, so if you see somebody on 150 milligrams or above, make sure that they're taking it in the morning time. Prestique, which is desvenlafaxine, is the active metabolite of venlafaxine. So, can I ask you a question? Sure. The so that's probably one of the more popular medicines for narcolepsy, right? For the, for the yeah. cataplexy, it, because of the... Do I have still prescribe it during the day or in that situation? So you're using a lower dose, so you can. Yeah, you're like, you're like 75 milligrams during the day. Cause, and, and, and venlafaxine, I think it's, you know, from my vantage point, it, it has an efficacy because it's, you know, orexin inhibits REM, but specifically also norepinephrine does too. And I think maybe that's why it works, you know. Yeah. Um, the the desvenlafaxine, so when you take venlafaxine, what's supposed to happen is it's supposed to get converted to desvenlafaxine through this system, but if somebody has a genetic polymorphism of this CYP2D6 system, it might go this way instead. So people, so psychiatrists that just want that norepinephrine component, they go ahead and they give the desvenlafaxine. But since norepinephrine is a key weight promoting neurotransmitter, make sure you take desvenlafaxine during the day period. Okay. Um, Deloxetine, uh, above 60 milligrams, make sure that you take it during the, the, the daytime in the morning because above 60, it increases norepinephrine. Deloxetine is usually in patients with depression and pain. Norepinephrine is a key neurotransmitter in the, the brain and spinal cord. If you increase norepinephrine, you suppress pain signals, and that's why it's been used for pain. Um, and so make sure this is given during the day. Um, Savella is FDA approved for uh, fibromyalgia in the United States. It's FDA approved for depression only in Europe. But this medication works on norepinephrine the most. Its ratio is actually um, four to one norepinephrine to serotonin. So this medication has to be given during the, the daytime. This is the last medication on the list, uh, bupropion. Uh, bupropion uh, inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and serotonin. Um, it's more activating than any SSRI. When we say the most activating antidepressant available, I have a disclaimer because if you use disipramine at 150 milligrams, you're occupying 50% of those norepinephrine <coughs> receptors. So disipramine at 150 would probably be more activating. But standard doses, um, this is the most activating antidepressant. And, uh, the issue is that it increases norepinephrine and, and dopamine.
dopamine, so it doesn't work on serotonin, so no PLMD, RLS, RBD, none of that stuff. Um, so there's three formulations. There's the immediate release, the sustained release, and the long-acting release. Um, the immediate, so this is based on a 300 milligram model. The Cmax is the highest concentration of the medication in your system, and the Tmax is the time that it takes to get there. So with the immediate release, you give 100 milligrams three times a day. Each dose has to be given four hours apart. So if you think about it, somebody takes it at 8, it's going to peak at 10. They're going to get activated, energetic at 10 a.m. Then you take it at 12, it peaks at um, 2. Then you take it at 4, it peaks at 6. But you don't want to be pumped up and activated in the evening at 6 o'clock, and it leads to insomnia. So what you really have to do, it, I really don't even use this formulation so much, anymore because unless you're a shift worker and you're starting your taking your first dose at 3 a.m. It's, it's going to really interfere with your sleep. The SR formulation is also based on a 300 milligram model um, and it's 150 twice a day. The Tmax is three hours. So you take it at 8, it'll peak at 11. You take it at 12, it'll peak at 3. So it's not, it's not going to be at a high concentration in the evening. It has time to be excreted from your system. And there's a lot of times in sleep clinic where someone's first dose of this is at 3 o'clock. So then it peaks at 6, and then they take it at 7, it peaks at 10, and it leads to insomnia. So you want to tell them to take this earlier in the day. I use this as ancillary support for narcolepsy when I max out on stimulants because, you know, the stimulants are basically bupropion on steroids. Um, the long-acting release formulation is probably the best one because it's Tmax is five hours. You take it at like seven in the morning or eight, it'll peak at 12 or one, and then it's low in your system at night, so it won't affect your sleep. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when patients um, who have ADHD, so just a side note, they get that crash from the stimulants. I usually give this one also because it creates that low level of that norepinephrine and dopamine so they don't get that crash. But the long, the main point of this med is make sure, you know, if you have to use it, I would suggest this formulation and taking it in the morning. Um, and if you see a patient in sleep clinic, you know, and they're taking it at night, obviously switch it to the morning time. How significant is the crashing from the immediate release? Because you have that activating and then we peaks and troughs, like, I mean, how bad is the trough? So we, we're doing some, we're, we've been working on that. It's, we don't have a big sample size. What I've been doing is the scales. Okay. And then during that crash, the score has been ranging from 10 to 15. Okay. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. But again, it's a small but sample. In, but in relative to how well they are at the peak, you know, like, like I mean, if they're activating at the peak at, you know, they take it at 8, at 10 o'clock, they feel like efforts, you know, at, at, at eight, and then by an hour later or two hours later, they feel that, oh my God. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. your question. Like, so, like that, so the, that the, relative decline, yeah. how sharp is it? It's not that bad with the, the bupropion. I thought you were talking about the stimulants, I apologize. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, so I was just kind of wondering, because, you know, I like that activating part, but, mm -hmm. but, but you know, how bad is the drop? Is it, is it like, you know, after that roll, you know, that, that yeah. crash. So I, I, you know, I probably say with the Adderall and the Ritalin and those, it's it's very sharp decline, but yes. it's not not so much. Okay. Right. But enough that it affects your sleep. If that, I know that's a pretty vague answer. But, you know, <laughs> um, so uh, in reference, you know, to, in summary, I'll say insomnia is highly affected by psychotropic medications. Only use these, you know, meds um, if you're going to use them for sleep. If there's an underlying mental health condition. Bupropion is the most activating antidepressant, followed by Prozac, uh, venlafaxine, and sertraline. In reference to the TCAs, the secondary ADs are the most activating. Doxepin is the only FDA-approved med for sleep in this talk, and mirtazapine is generally very sedating at 30 milligrams or less. Um, does anybody have any questions? This is kind of a cheat sheet, which kind of summarizes some of this stuff, um, but does anybody have any, any questions or concerns? Sorry, I sped things up at the end. I just wanted to make sure I no, got it's all good. It's all good. That was great. This is my third time listening to this, and I still don't. <laughs> Every time I still learn new things and ask questions. What about you know people here or people online? 
um, time to spit out questions. And I saw in the chat that most of the answers were correct answers <laughs> with those cases. <laughs> so actually, I, I've got a case. I'm just curious. curious. So, so the gentleman, and, uh, and I don't know the extent, but when he's got a diagnosis of anxiety slash depression, he has insomnia, um, has minimal sleep apnea at this point in time. Um, he's on affection. Um, but he's still complaining about issues with, with sleep, you know, so he's asking for a sleep aid. Uh, you know, so, you know, it's the question we're talking about. So I was talking with his psychiatrist, you know, <coughs> you know and he was also taking it in the Clomipin, and the psychiatrist said he would be fine if he used it as he uh, as long as he wasn't taking Clomipin, uh, which the patient is okay with. But I guess the question would be, would you first try to do something to modify his depression yeah, I, I think that the, the first step I, I would do is check the dosage. Uh, it probably, if he's on a therapeutic dose, he's on 225, 225 milligrams, and see if he's taking that at night or during the day. Um, but the, the other thing that I would really check for in that case is venlafaxine is notorious for causing PLMD. You know, I would ask him, are the bed sheets hanging off the bed, or the bed sheets on the floor, are they crumpled up in the corner of the bed? Uh, so many times when I screen for that, I, I, at least 50% of the time they're, they're positive. I, I would really screen for the, the PLMD in that case. Uh, in fact, that question was both on my, with the venlafaxine, it's so notorious for the PLMD, it was both on my sleep boards and psychiatry boards. I would check, I would ask him about that, the screen for the PLMD, and then um, ask him about, you know, um, what time he's taking it. He's, I, I could be off target, but I'm assuming he's probably taking 225 milligrams and, and, and ask them, you know, after you take the med, how do you feel? Do you feel sedated or do you feel energetic? Um, there's about for, there's about 20% of the population, it's very rare where effects are, can be sedating, but I think that has to do with the, the genetic polymorphism of the uh, CYP2D6 and maybe he's not metabolizing it to the norepinephrine and it might not be having that activating effect. If it's sedating, then take it at night. Or, but if it's activating, of course, then you know put it in the morning. But I would, I would, I would check that first, and then screen for the, the PLMD. Um, I, I can't, I guess, emphasize that enough. I don't want to be redundant, but I see it so often that the PLMD with that that med specifically. That's all. Anybody from our Zoom have any questions? Uh, those are all. I, I reviewed it. Yeah, they were not questions. Anything, Kingman? Yeah. Well, I, you know, this is a, this is one of those things that you need to go over and over again. So yeah. I can Absolutely. put this in the, uh, <clears throat> the PDF because what happens is that you see the patient, you look at their medication list, and you uh, think of their problems and your assessment, and your plan, and and uh, a lot of a lot of. There are three, at least three vectors. There's the medication that's in a histaminergic effects and its dose. So it's uh, three vectors that you have to think about. And it, it gets hard for doctors to think in more than three vectors. And then there's their mood disorder as well. So I think it's, uh, you, you have to flag it when you see these people as saying, this is something I have to follow along and identify in your in your plan, <clears throat> whether if if you do have them change their their time of day of taking medications or their dose, is that what are you going to follow and what are they going to tell you that makes it feel better? Because uh, that example you had of a person who might suggest that they have narcolepsy so is a good example of how you can be misdirected in various ways. Uh, uh, particularly if they come in with some sort of label that you have to really critique. So I'd like to see, I'd like to, again, I probably have the lecture somewhere, but uh, I'd like to see it again. All right. Thank you very much. So, Thank so you the other thing, is, other thing is, Kamal, you said that this is, uh, this is part one. 
Yeah, I, I, I uh, intentionally took out the, the antipsychotics and the, the bus, your favorite, the buspirone and a few right. other meds. So uh, probably uh, maybe I uh, have to revisit this, you know, with a part two at some point. Okay. Well, I think this is great. Yeah. And maybe before we do the part two, we send out a little survey to see how much people remember <laughs> part one. <laughs> I can, you know, come up with questionnaires with you together. And sure, see what sure, happens. sure. Okay. I think that would be interesting to see. So there's a question about weight gain in patients taking mirtazapine. <laughs> so the, the weight gain is, is more prominent at lower doses because it's strictly an antihistamine. Um, but, you know, as you go higher up uh, after 30, the weight gain is less, less intense. But the average weight gain is about five pounds per month in, in most patients. They, they, have, they have two stories. Um, now, there, is, there is that thought if you improve their depression, their activity levels go up and their weight gains. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So you, you sort of um, have to handle it by just attention to exercise and, and habits. The mirtazapine is an interesting one because that one they've shown in a few studies. You know, when patients have comorbid sleep apnea, it, it alters the upper airway tone, it alters the ventilation response to hypoxemia, and some people are using it off label for sleep apnea. Works, works in both dogs. <laughs> works in both dogs, there you go. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, no, the weight gain um, is usually about you know um, five pounds per month at doses less than 30. But if you know if the depression depression gets better, then you know, of course that's definitely something that could prevent the weight gain if we're more active. All right. So we'll end here today.